Warning, this experiment uses toxic chlorine gas. This must be performed outside or in a fumigate. Greetings fellow nerds, in this video we're going to make chlorotoluene. This is the first step to making the antiprotozoal drug pyrimethamine. There are a few approaches, so I'll show a couple of them here. First, we get a liter sized flask and add some fine steel wool. I'm using a 10 gram roll, but the exact quantity is not critical. Now we add 500 milliliters of toluene. This is sold as a paint thinner solvent. I had to acquire mine by fractionally distilling some lacquer thinner. Anyway, here's our mixture, and around it we set up this chlorine generator. I've already detailed how to make chlorine gas in a previous video, so I won't get into it here. My setup uses the trichloroisocyanuric acid and hydrochloric acid method. Now the chlorine gas generated is first led through this flask of concentrated sulfuric acid to dry it. My acid is brown black because it's very low grade drain cleaner acid. You don't need high quality acid as all it's doing is removing water and won't be part of the reaction. Now the dry chlorine gas exits through this tube where it goes down a reflux condenser on top of our flask containing toluene. The chlorine reacts with the toluene here and any toluene vapor is recondensed by the condenser. Any waste gases are sucked by this vacuum tube on top of the condenser and to the right. So let's get started. First we drip in the hydrochloric acid and we can see the yellow chlorine gas forming. I'm using enough reagents to produce 4 moles of chlorine atoms or 2 moles of diatomic chlorine gas. Go slowly as the toluene mixture can only absorb so much gas at a time. So moving over to the toluene, it'll take a minute or so for the air to perch out of the tubes before the chlorine gets to the toluene. And there we go. The reaction is very exothermic and you don't need to heat it up. I had a stir bar previously to help mixing in my reaction. What's happening is the chlorine is first reacting with the iron in the steel wool to produce ferric chloride. This ferric chloride then acts as a catalyst for the reaction of chlorine with toluene to produce chlorotoluene and hydrogen chloride. This is the textbook reaction of electrophilic halogenation taught in almost every university or college organic chemistry course. Now if you happen to have anhydrous ferric chloride, you can add that directly as a catalyst. Using steel wool is a cheaper amateur way of making ferric chloride in situ since we're already injecting chlorine gas. Okay, we're halfway done and the toluene seems to dissolve the polyethylene tubing. I'm not too worried though as we'll be distilling this reaction mixture later. You can avoid this by using polytetrafluoroethylene tubing or PTFE tubing. I'm just going to push the tubing further into the reaction and keep going since this tubing is cheap. Now you'll notice a lot of the steel wool remains. Ferric chloride is an extremely active catalyst for this reaction so only a tiny amount is needed. It works so fast to react the chlorine with the toluene that no chlorine is left over to dissolve more steel wool. Looking back, I probably could have gotten away with just using a couple of grams of steel wool, but no well. Now I must emphasize to do this reaction a few minutes. As said before, the byproduct is hydrogen chloride. Hydrogen chloride has very low solubility in toluene and most of it will exit out the top of the reflux condenser. That's why I had the vacuum tube at the top of the condenser as I showed earlier. Nonetheless, some of it will likely escape, so you're going to need a good fume hood or to work outside. Okay, all the chlorine has been added. Now we just let the mixture stir for an hour to complete the reaction, and then we let it cool completely to room temperature. Here we are after everything is at room temperature. Now we add 500 milliliters of water to dissolve the iron chlorides, any soluble impurities, as well as wash out any residual hydrogen chloride. Well, I forgot to remove the unreacted steel wool. You can use an iron wire hook to fish it out. Strictly speaking, it isn't necessary to remove the wool, it just makes it easier later. Okay, back to the mixture. We add the rest of the water and give it a thorough stir to wash the chlorotoluenes. Turn off the stir and let the layers separate. Now we remove the lower aqueous layer. If you have a separatory funnel that can handle a liter of solution then use that. I don't, so I'm just going to use a tube and siphon out the bottom layer. Here we are after most of the aqueous layer has been removed. At this point we now add a saturated solution of sodium bicarbonate, also known as baking soda. The amount you should add should bring the total solution volume to 1 liter again. What we're doing here is using the alkaline sodium bicarbonate to react away any remaining hydrogen chloride. The hydrogen chloride must be removed to make the subsequent distillation easier. Now once again we remove the aqueous layer by siphoning. And here we are, our washed mixture of clude chlorotoluenes, byproducts, and unreacted toluene. To separate it we're going to use our least favorite technique, fractional distillation. What distills off first is going to be a tiny amount of residual water from the washings and toluene. 
then pure toluene will distill over at 110 Celsius. Continue distilling until the temperature rises to 135 Celsius. Then switch out the receiver and you'll then be distilling the chlorotoluenes. Chlorotoluenes themselves distill around 160 Celsius. Continue distilling until nothing distills over, or if you reach a temperature of 170 Celsius. And there you have it, chloral toluene. Now making chloral toluene this way with chlorine gas is fairly clean and straightforward. The waste products from the chlorine source remain separate from the chlorination reaction, and only hydrogen chloride gas is produced which boils away or can be easily washed out. However, you might prefer a method that doesn't involve any toxic gases and their associated safety hazards. I'll briefly go over another method I tried that avoids gases at the cost of more involved separation steps. First we start with 125 grams of anhydrous ferrous chloride. This will serve as our catalyst for the reaction. You can also use anhydrous ferric chloride if you happen to have it. Do not use hydrate iron salts as water is detrimental to this reaction. Unfortunately steel wool cannot be used for this approach. I tried it and it doesn't work. I'll detail how to make anhydrous ferrous chloride if there's enough interest. Anyway, now connect a Claisen adapter fitted with a reflux condenser in a funnel. We'll be adding reagents through the funnel and then sealing in between additions. Now to this ferrous chloride add 500 milliliters of dry toluene. This toluene was dried by azeotropic distillation using a Dean Stark trap as shown in a previous video. Now vigorously stir the reaction mixture and add to it 10 grams of trichloroisocyanuric acid powder every 15 minutes for a total of 160 grams over 4 hours. Between additions, take the funnel out and stop with the Claisen adapter so the vapors go into the reflux condenser instead. What's happening is the trichloroisocyanuric acid is reacting with the toluene to directly form chlorotoluene and cyanuric acid. The ferrous chloride serves as a catalyst. As you can see, no gas are produced or consumed, so this requires a much simpler setup to perform without a complicated gas generator. Now you need to go slowly when adding the trichloroisocyanuric acid because the reaction is very exothermic and going too fast will result in a thermal runaway. Trust me, I blundered quite a few times trying to speed this up. If you notice the mixture is starting to reflux or boil, then stop further additions and let it cool before continuing. If you go slow enough, you'll never see any refluxing and in fact the condenser will never be needed. Nonetheless, I still recommend including it just in case. Now once all the trichloroisocyanuric acid has been added, let it continue stirring for at least a couple of hours after it has reached room temperature. I let mine continue stirring overnight. Now we have to separate the chloral toluenes from the cyanuric acid and ferrous chloride. This is a bit tedious because we can't just distill it as it's too thick and gooey. Filtering is also problematic as the particles are fine enough to clog the filter and a lot of it remains soaked in the residues. The most effective way I found was to add an equal volume of water and then set up a Dean Stark apparatus. The water is the carrier fluid and will carry out the toluene and chlorotoluenes. Note that toluene is lighter than water and chlorotoluene is heavier than water, so you'll have to change the operational mode of your Dean Stark apparatus as the recovery progresses. Eventually I was able to fully separate the organics from the residues. After that we then separate the water and just fractionally distill the organics to separate toluene and chlorotoluene just like we described previously. As you can see, this method, while avoiding gases, pays for its reactive simplicity with a more complicated separation step. And there you have it, two ways of making chlorotoluene. Now the chlorination of toluene actually forms different isomers of chlorotoluene, all with very similar properties. Orthochlorotoluene, where the toluene is next to the methyl group, also known as 2-chlorotoluene. Metachlorotoluene, where the chlorine is another carbon over, and also called 3-chlorotoluene and parachlorotoluene, where the chlorine is furthest away from the methyl group. This is also known as 4-chlorotoluene. Now in electrophilic halogenation, the methyl group actually affects the electron distribution of the aromatic ring, and metachlorotoluene product is negated, so only trace amounts are produced. The major products are ortho and parachlorotoluene. To make pyrimethamine, we want parachlorotoluene. Unfortunately, the two methods I've shown produce orthochlorotoluene as a major product. The reason why it took me two months to make this video was because I spent most of it researching and testing other methods to make chlorotoluenes, in hopes of getting parachlorotoluene as the major product. They all failed. Now you're probably wondering how I know this and test it for the ratio of isomers if the properties of all the isomers are very similar. I kinda cheated and sent a sample of my chlorine toluene mixtures to a laboratory that performed nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy analysis. 
They then send me back this printout that shows the nucleomagnetic resonance spectrum or NMR spectrum for my sample. I know it all looks complicated, but this spectrum tells me the ratio of chloral toluenes produced. The worst method I found was reacting a 50% sulfuric acid solution with toluene and trichloroisocyanuric acid. While it did produce chlorotoluenes in good yield, only 28% was the desired pair isomer. The rest was the unwanted orthoisomer. Somewhat better was using chlorine gas and various forms of iron chloride catalysts. I tried small amounts of steel wool as I showed here, I tried huge amounts of steel wool. I even tried anhydrous ferrous chloride all while using chlorine gas. I got chlorotoluene with parachlorotoluene percentages in the mid 30s. The best method so far was the method of using ferrous chloride catalyst and directly adding the trichloroisocyanuric acid to the toluene mixture. This gave me a parachlorotoluene percentage of 41%. After two months of work and $1,000 of wasted chemicals, broken glassware, and NMR spectroscopy fees, I decided to stop here and just show the best and most straightforward methods in this video. The task isn't impossible though. Parachlorotoluene can be made easily enough with laboratory grade chemicals in a multi step approach. But for amateur synthesis, the chemicals are very difficult to acquire or purify. Perhaps in a future video, I'll return to this problem and see if I can make parachlorotoluene in one step. For now, we can still use this mixture of ortho and parachlorotoluene isomers by adding a second separation step to isolate just the parachlorotoluene. I'll be showing the isolation step in an upcoming video. Thanks for watching! If you would like to support the continued production of science videos like this one, please support the channel on Patreon. Links are in the video description.